Once Queen Rhaenyra and her Black Council had finally come up with a plan to end the Dance of the Dragons that was agreeable to all, it was time to put it in action. However, it was vital that King's Landing was not left undefended. Even a small host with a dragon at his back could take the city with ease. Queen Rhaenyra would remain in the city with Sorax and her sons, Aegon and Joffrey, whose persons could not be put at risk. Joffrey was not quite 13, but was eager to prove himself a warrior like his fallen older brothers were. But when he was told that Tyrax was needed to help his mother hold the Red Keep in the event of an attack, the boy swore solemnly to do so. Adam Valarian, formerly the bastard Adam of Hull, the Sea Snake's heir, would also remain in the city with Sea Smoke. Three dragons should suffice for the defence of King's Landing. The rest would be going into battle. Prince Daemon himself would take Caraxes to the Trident, together with the Dragon Seed Nettles and her dragon Sheepstealer, to find Prince Aemon One-Eye and Vagar and put an end to their reign of terror over the Riverlands. And thus, Rhaenyra's biggest threat, Ulf White and Hard Hugh Hammer, would fly to Tumbleton, some 50 leagues southwest of King's Landing, the last loyal stronghold between Lord Hightower's host and the city, to assist in the defence of the town and castle, and destroy Prince Daron and Tessarion in the process. Lord Corliss suggested that maybe perhaps the prince might be taken alive and held as a hostage, but Queen Rhaenyra was adamant he will not remain a boy forever. Let him grow to manhood and soon or late he will seek revenge upon me or my sons, or even crown himself king. Words of these plans soon reached the ears of Dowager Queen Alicent Hightower, filling her with terror. Fearing for her remaining sons, Queen Alicent went to the Iron Throne upon her knees to plead for peace. This time, the Queen in Chains put forth the notion that the realm might be divided. Rhaenyra would keep the King's Landing and the Crown Lands, the North, the Vale, and all the lands watered by the Trident and the Isles. To Aegon would go the Stormlands, the Westerlands, and the Reach, to be ruled from Old Town. Rhaenyra rejected her stepmother's proposals with scorn. Your sons might have had place of honour at my court if they had kept faith her grace declared, but they sought to rob me of my birthright, and the blood of my sweet sons is on their hands. Bastards' blood, shed at war, Alicent replied. My sons were innocent boys, cruelly murdered. How many more must die to slack your thirst of vengeance? The Dowager Queen's words only fanned the flames of Rhaenyra's wrath. I will hear no more lies, she warned. Speak again of bastardy, and I will have your tongue out. Or so the tale is told by Septon Eustace. Munkin says the same thing in his true telling, so in all likelihood, these events are true. On the headwaters of the mighty Manda stood Tumbleton, a thriving market town and a seat of House Footley. The castle overlooking the town was stout, but small, garrisoned by no more than 40 men, but thousands more had come up river from Bitterbridge, Longtable and farther south. The arrival of the strong forces of the river lords swelled their numbers further and stiffened their resolve. Fresh from their victory at the Butcher's Ball came Sir Garibald Grey and Longleaf the Lion Slayer with the head of Sir Criston Cole upon a spear. Red Rob Rivers and his archers, the last of the Winter Wolves and a score of landed knights and petty lords whose lands lay along the banks of the Blackwater. Amongst them, men of note such as most lander of yore, Sir Garrick Hall of Middleton, Sir Merrill the Bold, and Lord Owen Bornley. All told, the forces gathered under Queen Rhaenyra's banner at Tumbleton numbered near 9,000, according to the true telling. Other chroniclers make the number as high as 12, or as low as 6, but in all these cases, it seems plain that the Queen's men were greatly outnumbered by Lord Hightower's host. No doubt, the arrivals of the dragons of Vermithlaw and Silverwing with their riders was most welcomed by the defenders of Tumbleton. Little could be known of the horrors that awaited them. The how and the when and the why of what has become known as the treason of Tumbleton remains a matter of much dispute, and the truth of what happened will likely never truly be known. It does appear that certain of those who flooded into the town, fleeing before Lord Hightower's army, were actually part of that army, sent ahead to infiltrate the ranks of the defenders. Beyond question, two of the Blackwater men who had joined the River Lords on their march south, Lord Owen Bornley and Sir Roger Crone, were secret supporters of Aegon II, yet their betrayals would have counted for little 
had not Sir Ulf White and Sir Hugh Hammer also chosen this moment to change their allegiances. Most of what we know of these men comes from Mushroom. The dwarf is clear in his assessment of the low character of these two dragon riders, painting the former as a drunkard and the latter as a brute. Both were craven, he tells us. It was only when they saw Lord Ormond's host with their spear points glistening in the sun and its lines of march stretching back for long leagues that they decided to join him, rather than oppose him. Yet neither man had hesitated to face the storms of spears and arrows of Driftmark. It may be that it was the thought of attacking Tessarion and Daron that gave them pause. In the gullet, all the dragons had been on their own side. This too may be possible, though both Vermithor and Silverwing were older and larger than Prince Daron's dragon, and would therefore have been more likely to prevail in any battle. Others suggest that it was avarice, not cowardice that led White and Hammer to betrayal. Honour meant little and less to them. It was wealth and power they lusted for. After the Battle of the Gullet and the Fall of King's Landing, they had been granted knighthoods. They aspired to be lords, and scorned the modest holdings bestowed on them by Queen Rhaenyra. When Lord Rosby and Stokeworth were executed, it was proposed that White and Hammer be given their lands and castles, through marriage to their daughters, but Her Grace had allowed the treasonous sons to inherit instead. Then, Storm's End and Casterly Rock were dangled before them, but these rewards, as well as the ungrateful Queen, had denied them. No doubt they hoped that King Aegon II might reward them better, should they help return the Iron Throne to him. It might even be that certain promises were made to them in this regard, possibly through Lord Laris the Clubfoot, or one of his agents, though this remains unproven and will always be unprovable. As neither man could read nor write, we shall never know what drove them. Of the Battle of Tumbleton, we know much and more. 6,000 of the Queen's men formed up to face Lord Hightower in the field, under the command of Sir Garibald Grey. They fought bravely for a time, but a withering rain of arrows from Lord Ormond's archers thinned their rank, and a thunderous charge by his heavy horses broke them, sending the survivors running back towards the town walls. There, Red Rob Brewers and his bowmen stood, covering the retreat with their own longbows. When most of the survivors were safe inside the gates, Roddy the Ruin and his winter wolves sallied forth from a postern gate, screaming their terrifying northern war cries as they swept around the left flank of the attackers. In the chaos that ensued, the Northmen fought their way through ten times their own number, to where Lord Ormond Hightower sat his war horse, beneath Aegon's golden dragon, and the banners of Old Town and the Hightowers. As the singers tell it, Lord Roderick was bloody from head to heel, as he came on, with splintered shield and a cracked helm, yet so drunk with battle that he did not even seem to feel his wounds. Sir Bryden Hightower, Lord Ormond's cousin, put himself between the Northmen and his liege, taking off Roddy the Ruin's shield arm at the shoulder with one terrible blow of his long axe. Yet the savage Lord of Barrington fought on, slaying both Sir Bryden and Lord Ormond before he died. Lord Hightower's banners toppled, and the townsfolk gave a great cheer, thinking the tide of the battle had been turned. Even the appearance of Tessarion across the field did not dismay them, for they knew they had two dragons of their own. But when Vermithor and Silverwing climbed into the sky and loosed their fires upon Tumbleton, those cheers changed to screams. Tumbleton went up in flames. Shops, homes, seps, people. Men fell burning from gatehouses and battlements, or stumbled shrieking through the streets like so many living torches. Outside the walls, Prince Daron swooped down upon Tessarion. Pate of Longleaf was unhorsed and trampled, Sir Garibald Grey pierced by a crossbow bolt, then engulfed by dragon flame. The two betrayers scourged the town with whips of flame from one end to the other. Sir Roger Crone and his men chose that moment to show their true colours, cutting down the defenders on the town gate and throwing them open to the attackers. Lord Owen Borney did the same within the castle, driving a spear through the back of Sir Merrill the Bold. The sack that followed was as savage as any in the history of Westeros. Tumbleton, the prosperous market town, was reduced to ash and embers. Thousands burned and as many died by drowning as they tried to swim the river. Some would later say that they were fortunate ones, for no mercy was shown to the survivors. Lord Footley's men threw down their swords and yielded, only to be bound and beheaded. Such townswomen, as survived the fires, were raped repeatedly. Old men and boys were put to the sword, whilst the dragons fed upon the twisted, smoking carcasses of their victims. Tumbleton was never to recover, though later the Footleys would attempt to rebuild atop the ruins. Their new town would never be a tenth the size of the old, for the small folk said the very ground was haunted 